Okay, I'm going to be live in just a jiffy now. Okay, hi everybody. This is Meta Spencer in Toronto. And uh, I am uh, happy to say that we're going to have a very interesting conversation with some of my friends. Uh, two of my friends who are in opposite sides of this continent. Uh, Yeshua Moser uh, points one is in Victoria at his, uh, at his desk in a very interesting looking office that's very suitable for an activist. And uh, Aaron Hunt is uh, in Ottawa at the Minds Action Canada office, or maybe she's at home. Are you at home now? I'm at home right now, so okay. I excuse the cat interruptions. No, please don't excuse the cat. I want to, I, I hope the cat comes right along. And uh, you also have a very interesting little sculpture in the background that if I had time, I would ask you about. Um, anyway, both of you are activists in Minds Action Canada and have been very recently in Geneva for a couple of weeks, I think, for two conferences dealing with the uh, terrible weapons threats. So I wanna have a conversation with you about these two conferences and um, what you learned there and what you can alert us to. Before we started, I had a few minutes with Yeshua who is making my blood curdle as uh, we discuss the first uh, of these conferences. Um, so uh, let's start off by uh, having Yeshua repeat this narrative, if you will, uh, about uh, where you've been and the name of this very long-winded um, conference that you attended. But first, I want Aaron to say hello so that the camera will show you for a second. Oh. Hi there. <laughs> <laughs> Looking forward to having the conversation. Yeah, very good. So it'll come back to you in a second. Now, Yeshua, take it away. Tell us what you told me the other day, the few minutes ago. Okay, and Aaron, just jump in here at any point in time that, uh, that, you, that you want to. Um, we were both attending uh, the Convention on Certain Conventional Weapons Group of governmental experts on lethal autonomous weapon systems. Uh, both of us were there as members of the Stop Killer Robots campaign. That is a global civil society campaign, which is seeking to get a legally binding instrument uh, that will uh, prevent the, the preemptive, uh, it'll be a preemptive ban on the use and development of these weapons. And when we're talking about killer robots, don't think of the Hollywood Terminator or anything like that. Think of small swarms of self-organizing machines that have, are running under an algorithm that no one knows who wrote because it's a military secret. And that algorithm controls the machinery which determines who will be killed by that machinery. And these things can be very small, very inexpensive to produce, which means not only can nation states get into this game, but other groups of people with some level of resources, be they corporations, criminal enterprises, guerrilla organizations, or whatnot. Um, it will lower the threshold of armed conflict because it will lower the cost of getting into a conflict. And it will make for some governments the uh, attraction to conflict uh, more because it will appear to be bloodless for them. So these things are a potential game changer in the military field. They have the possibility of making almost everything we think of as a military measure now redundant. Now look, there's nobody in the world who would go along with this. So you're going to have to convince me that anybody is really taking this option seriously, that they're planning or have any hope or aspiration to build such a thing. Is that, tell me, tell me you've just been kidding me. Uh, one week after this conference finished and it did not finish the way that the Stop Killer Robots campaign wanted, 
Uh, the United States committed two billion to artificial. The United States Defense Department committed two billion to artificial intelligence technology. Well, what is that? Artificial intelligence sounds like something I mean, everybody would like. I, I would like a little extra intelligence myself. But that, uh, what makes you think that is what they're going to do with it? Uh, are you sure that this is an allocation for killer robots? Well, no, I don't. But uh, what killer robots are, are a marriage of robotics technology and artificial intelligence, and then it is weaponized. And what? Um, uh, it is weaponized. Uh -huh. um, our campaign has no problem with the development of artificial intelligence or robotic that meets human needs and makes human life uh, more uh, pleasant on the planet. What we have a problem with is the weaponization of this technology, and that is precisely what militaries do. So we can have a fairly good, um, we can have a fairly bad feeling about the Defense Department rather than universities putting money into artificial intelligence uh, development. Okay. Aaron, Aaron, why don't you jump in here? Yeah, I, I'm curious about whether you uh, are thinking exactly alike, or whether you got something different from what you picked up in the. In, it was Geneva where you went. Uh, in fact, let's talk a little bit about the, the nature of the conference. Once I get over reeling from shock about the, uh, the kind of weapons you're saying they're doing. Yes. So um, just to be clear, the, um, for the most part, are future weapons. Um, so we're, we're trying to be preemptive here with the, with the law. And... Um, uh, I think one is like Yesh was very correct that the problem is the weaponization. So we have no problem with like using artificial intelligence to clear up leftover explosives from after a conflict, like explosive ordnance disposal. There's probably lots of really good ways we can use robotics and artificial intelligence to make something like that a lot safer. Um, but it's when it becomes weaponized, when it becomes uh, using force against. Uh, against people that it becomes problematic. Uh, so the Convention on Certain Conventional Weapons, which is admittedly a ridiculous name for a treaty, uh, <laughs> is a UN uh, treaty that has a number of protocols under it. So it has um, around 120 states, I believe, that belong to parts of it, and it has um, it has a very successful prohibition on blinding laser weapons, which is what we're sort of basing our work on here. So it's um, a preemptive ban, like you've never heard about blinding laser weapons being used in, in war. And that's because we uh, states started to work on them, realized that this was a terrible idea. Mm -hmm. And then they went ahead and negotiated a preemptive ban on the technology. And that was under this Convention on Conventional Weapons, or CCW. So the CCW has had uh, a number of years of meetings on this topic. They've had some of uh, what they call informal expert meetings, where they brought in academics, uh, tech leaders, um, and other experts to essentially present to the diplomats and talk about the issues, whether it's from an international security perspective, whether it's from a robotics perspective, an ethics perspective, a legal perspective, um, an engineering perspective, uh, a security perspective. Um, they all came and talked. And then for the last two years, they've had what is called a group of governmental experts. So that's when the governments are supposed to start talking and like bringing out their own expertise, as opposed to having these experts come in and just sort of provide panel discussions. Mm -hmm. um, Sorry, did you have a question? Well, yeah, I was, uh, uh, go ahead. I, I do have a question about the, the nature of the organization, but go on. Yeah, okay. Um, so right now we're in a group of governmental experts. So that means all the governments are supposed to bring their experts with them to Geneva, um, which usually means um, somebody from, often it's a lot of military experts, although we're always pushing for technological experts as well. Um, there's so many technological experts in our campaign, um, and we know that they have brought a lot of value to the discussion, and we're hoping that governments will bring people that know things about artificial intelligence and mm -hmm. all that with them. 
Um, so this group of governmental experts is supposed to explore um, options in the field of emerging technologies related to lethal autonomous weapon systems. So it's, it's kind of got a pretty conversational um, mandate right now. And we were hoping in the last meeting to get a more concrete mandate next time because uh, there are sort of like a few different groups of states forming within this UN body. There's a group, a pretty decent sized group of states that wants new international law um, about this technology. And there was actually a proposal put forward by Austria, Brazil, and Chile to um, start negotiations on a new treaty to prohibit autonomous weapon systems. Mm -hmm. uh, there's another group that wants to do something, but they're looking more at a political declaration. So a non-binding agreement that sets out regulations and all that sort of thing. Um, but even within that little group, there's now some like sort of subgroups where some groups think that it's that's gonna be enough. And another other group, people, states within that group think that it's a first step towards something else. And then there's a third group that is um, saying, you know, we already have international humanitarian law, we have international human rights law, we have requirements to do weapon reviews of weapons before we use them. That's enough. We just have to make sure we do those right. So let's talk about how we do all those things. Um, so those are the three main groups, although the end of the last day and the last day went to 1.13 in the morning and full disclosure, I went home early because I don't work till 1.30 in the morning after a full long week. Mm -hmm. It was just very, very tiring and we couldn't, I couldn't wait, civil society couldn't weigh in. So I went home and had a sensible meal and went to bed. Um, but if some people in that end there started talking about, well, maybe there could be benefits to lethal autonomous weapon systems, which from a campaign perspective is bonkers. Um, well, it's a little late to bring the subject up, besides which, of course, it sounds crazy from the get go. Yes. Yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah. So um, that's that's sort of where we're at right now. Um, okay. Well, let me back up at the beginning and, and sure. run through what you've been saying, because at the very beginning, even the concept of conventional weapons, uh, I wonder, to my mind, conventional weapons simply refers to everything except nuclear or chemical or biological. That's exactly is right. That, is that right? Yes. So if you if you have a tank or a, a pistol, that would be a conventional weapon, presumably. But within that category, you're talking about some specific new weapons that to my mind are not very conventional at all. Mm -hmm. Obviously artificial intelligence is not any convention that I'm, I was brought up in. Yeah. <laughs> I hope not you either. Yeah. Um, so this, I think last year there was a meeting called a uh, conference on certain conventional weapons, which yeah. covered this specific issue, right? The lethal autonomous weapons are what we call killer robots, right? Now, was this meeting that you attended just about killer robots or uh, was it uh, a variety of other things um, that were sort of similar? Um, Meta, don't get hung up on the name conventional weapons because this convention was um, started in the 1980s when they didn't really see many of the things that were coming in the future. The governments who are a party to that, about 120, as Aaron said, um, they consider themselves the sole negotiating forum on new disarmament measures. Um, so anything that's coming up is going to go to them. Uh, and I agree we with got, your- sorry, We've got 120 countries that are that form this like a committee it is an actual international convention it's a body of law and it's got several protocols and just because you join the convention doesn't mean you're bound by the protocol you have to join each protocol then um, and they have a protocol on explosive weapons they've got a protocol on mines they've got a protocol on blinding laser weapons as aaron mentioned uh, which is the one that we take as a precedent 
um, and a couple of other protocols in there. So it is a body of law. Not everybody, uh, not all of the governments that have joined this specific convention on certain conventional weapons have joined each of their five protocols, or is it six? Um, and, and so they have to do that um, separately. They have to join the protocols separately. Uh, so it's, an, it's both a body of law and a negotiating forum. Okay, now you're, you're with Mines Action Canada, which is part of the group that negotiated the uh, Landmines Convention. And I guess you're working on cluster munitions next. Is that part of your mandate? Yes. Yes. So we were a co-founder of the camp, uh, the cluster munition coalition and um, Yeshua can speak more to that because he was staff during the convention on cluster munitions negotiations. Um, essentially we work on what we call humanitarian disarmament. So we look at um, indiscriminate weapons from a humanitarian perspective and look at the human impact of those weapons. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay, so now um, there are tw 122 countries that come to these powwows, right? And, and all of them have signed some of the uh, protocols that you're talking about. These protocols are in effect like treaties. Yeah. Right. And they are treaties that have banned or limited the use of certain weapons and landmines being one of them. And what are the others again? Uh, most of their, the, the, I guess you could call them sub-treaties within this larger treaty body, um, regulate weapons. They don't ban them. Uh, so they have a protocol on anti-personnel landmines. However, that protocol only regulates landmine use. That's one of the reasons why the Ottawa Convention was created, because we decided that did not stop the humanitarian harm caused by these weapons. We sought a comprehensive ban. Mm -hmm. And so at that point in time, the international campaign to ban landmines, Canada and a handful of other states moved outside of the CCW, outside of the UN system and negotiated the first international uh, treaty banning a weapon outside of the UN system that had ever occurred. It was a visionary process. Um, and it is probably the foreign policy measure of Canada that has had the most positive impact around the planet, improving people's lives. Uh, mm -hmm. Because before the Ottawa Convention uh, came into being, there were about 20,000 casualties per year to anti-personnel landmines. That has dropped to a few thousand today. And so those are measurable numbers of people whose lives we've saved, mm -hmm. you know, who, who were not maimed and living maimed by these weapons. Mm -hmm. uh, every Canadian can feel proud of the Ottawa Convention because yeah. it's just had such a positive impact on the planet. Mm -hmm. and to a great degree, it opened the door for a whole new field of disarmament activities, which we call humanitarian disarmament, or mm -hmm. what I call disarmament as though people mattered. Okay, now are you saying now that because this thing was, uh, this Ottawa con Treaty was negotiated outside the UN system, it remains um, administratively separate from the UN and was not part of the um, it's not part of the organization that you went to attend in Geneva. That's not their mandate anymore because you've um, taken it away from them. Is, is that true? Or is it now under the certain convention? I mean, is it as part of the conventional weapons um, or, or agency or whatever you want to call that group? I'm just trying to get a map of the organizational structure. Right. No. Until you the, just told me that. The Ottawa Convention comprehensively bans the weapon, and we can see that it is working. Uh, it uh, not only bans a weapon system, but it looks 
at the human impact of that weapon systems and tries to do remediation. So you have mine clearance programs that are mandated under that convention. You have the assistance of victims that are mandated under that process. And so this makes it very, very different than the type of state-based disarmament negotiations that had previously gone on within the UN system. There are a handful of states that remain outside of the Ottawa Convention. Most of them are party to this optional protocol in the CCW, which regulates mine use. Mm -hmm. um, and so uh, it is kind of like the um, uh, safe house for the, uh, the ones who don't want to do the right thing. <laughs> OK. OK, so you had this, this thing. Now, Erin uh, uh, gave me a very quick and, and uh, clear uh, a summary of what all went on. I take it that you there were uh, your civil society people. You are, do you, this was a meeting of experts, right? And you guys have brought some expertise to the table. How is that organized? Do the civil society participants sit at the same tables and in the same audience and, and uh, under the same chairmanship? as the uh, representatives of uh, various countries? Or do you meet separately and try to lobby them? Or, or how does that work? Erin, maybe you can clarify yeah. that for me. Yeah, so it's, um, we're like all the different UN bodies have different rules about civil society. And in this case, uh, we are allowed to be in the room, we do, make interventions and deliver statements um, during the, the debates, uh, except for the final negotiation of the chair's report. Um, so we bring our expertise literally into the room, into the discussion. Um, and we also host um, briefing events uh, during lunchtime usually. And um, this time we did two panel um, discussions over lunch. One included um, Bonnie Doherty of um, Harvard Law School and Human Rights Watch, uh, Peter Acero, who is the uh, a, a co-founder of the International Committee for Robot Arms Control, um, as well as uh, a representative from the Tech Workers Coalition, who is a uh, um, software engineer from Google who was instrumental in the um, internal actions that led to Google canceling a uh, Pentagon contract, as well as a representative from the Future of Life Institute that has been doing a lot of work on um, autonomous, uh, bringing on uh, scientific experts um, to speak out against uh, the idea of autonomous weapons. Um, they've organized a large number of open letters that have gotten thousands of signatures from around the world of um, experts in this field that are calling for a ban. And then the second um, civil society briefing event was on sort of gender and a feminist approach to disarmament and what that would look like um, with regards to autonomous weapons. Um, and on that panel, we had representatives from, it was, uh, it was organized by Minds Action Canada and um, Reaching Critical Will, which is a part of the Women's International League for Peace and Freedom. Mm -hmm as well as Project Plowshares and um, the Canadian Mission. Uh, so we ended up having representatives that we had myself, we had a representative from Reaching Critical Will, we had a representative from uh, Women's International League for Peace and Freedom, um, Cameroon, uh, as well as someone from International Committee for Robot Arms Control and Project Plowshares. And we all discussed different aspects of sort of a feminist approach to disarmament and what that means um, for autonomous, uh, these discussions on autonomous weapons. Um, so we do have a, a number of ways of presenting information in this, um, mm -hmm. this event. And we also try and meet one-on-one -on -one with government representatives um, to talk about uh, positions and, you know, okay. address so concerns they may like, have. In the civil society thing, you included, I was fat, struck by the fact that you had somebody from Google uh, now, that, uh, I don't know whether, uh, sometimes uh, corporations are considered part of civil society, but mostly, I think, not. 
Uh, but uh, I, I was wondering, this sounds like the, the expertise that you bring to bear in these things have more to do with uh, international law and ethics, morality, than it has to do with the technological expertise of people knowing how to do things. Now, Google clearly knows a thing or two about artificial intelligence. Somebody in their uh, corporation knows a lot about it. Are you saying that this fellow managed to get Google uh, to cancel a contract with the Pentagon on moral grounds? Um, well, he, he was speaking as part of an organization um, that's called the Tech Workers Coalition, which is a, um, uh, an organization of um, employees for a number of uh, sort of tech firms that want to see their work being used for good. Um, so what happened was uh, the uh, Google, um, so he was not speaking on behalf of Google. Um, oh, that's a disappointment because I, I was loving the fact that, you know, Google has this wonderful motto don't be evil. <laughs> and, and this would be a beautiful application of not being evil yeah. if they actually canceled a contract with the Pentagon because it was so evil. Oh. I, I guess that's stretching uh, the story a little bit to conclude that that's the way they presented it or framed it. Um, or no, that's so what happened was that it became um, staff at Google found out about this Project Maven, this contract they had with um, the Pentagon that was involving facial recognition technology and looking at um, analyzing visual images and all that sort of sort of visual stuff for um, the Pentagon and the employees themselves, including the gentleman who joined our panel, um, got together and realized they didn't want their work to be used in this way. They didn't want to be, do evil. Mm -hmm. So they um, wrote a letter to the CEO and had, the, I want to say 3,000 employees sign on and they had um, uh, support from outside academics and students um, also writing to Google saying, don't do this, cancel this contract. So the contract's not going to be renewed um, because the staff sort of refused. Okay, can you say that there's anybody in government itself um, who will uh, take a stand against it on moral grounds? Is this something, or I guess they're, they're sent by the government, what, but how does it break down? Do you find any allies um, in, in any government? Well, you, you mentioned some, some countries, but I'm thinking of the, of the US government, which would be presumably the source of all these nuclear uh, weapons. Um, are, are there people uh, in the government who, who are saying this is just unacceptable? Yes, well, do you want to weigh in or should I keep going? Uh, why don't you keep going? Uh, I'll weigh in if I need to on it. Okay. Um, yeah, so there are definitely governments that object to this potential technology on moral and ethical grounds. Um, we've seen very strong statements about the morality and ethics of this technology from countries like the Holy See. Poland has done quite a bit of work on the, the sort of ethics behind this and the ethical considerations to look into. Um, and there are always people representing governments that I'm sure have different opinions than their government policy. Um, and in particular, the United States does have a Department of Defense directive um, that essentially says there will always be um, a, a human involved in decision making um, of weapons uh, at the moment. Uh, so, but that's a directive and that can change. Um, and their negotiate or discussion positions uh, in Geneva were not as supportive of that position as you would have hoped, I think is a polite way of saying it. Oh, okay. Please elaborate. Yeshua, do you have... Yeah, well, you I would add to what you said. There are 28 governments now within this process that have at one point in time in these discussions made a public statement that they were supportive of... Um, 
new binding international law prohibiting a putting a preemptive ban in place on the development and use of these weapons. Um, so we have about 28 allies, as it were, um, towards that end. Uh, the number of states who uh, make statements that are completely opposed to us are a small number. Uh, there's about four or five of them. Um, they tend to be fairly powerful and persuasive states. But we have some very unusual allies, powerful and persuasive. The P5? No. Um, actually, China is one of our allies. Uh, strangely enough, Pakistan is one of our allies, Very made very strong uh, statements in favor of uh, a ban. Uh, France has not been very supportive at all. Uh, mm -hmm. The U.S., of course, is not. Uh, oh, France is, is a bad guy, and the U.S. is a bad guy. Who are the other bad guys? Aaron, do you remember? Um, well, I, I prefer to refer to them as states that have not yet been come on board. Um, <laughs> Correct. Yes, states that have not yet come on board. Uh, we are seeing um, some uh, outspoken positions from Russia, as well as uh, uh, Israel wasn't too outspoken on this uh, meeting, but in the past they have been a bit. Um, and then there's a few countries that are just very concerned about what a prohibition would mean for their own robotics industry. So. Countries like South Korea and Japan um, are very concerned about ensuring that their robotics industry can continue to um, flourish. Uh, well, Charlie, you can make robots that do good things as well as bad things. Yeah, that's actually one of our, our um, one of the reasons we have so many uh, roboticists and artificial intelligence um, experts supporting this work is this campaign is because they want their work to be used for good. They don't want their work to be used um, for these sorts of things. And it'll be much easier if there's a, to protect the reputation of their work, of protect mm -hmm. the reputation of robotics and artificial intelligence, if it's not mm -hmm. out there killing people. Okay, what, if, what do you expect to come of all this? If, let's say you get some sort of treaty, I don't know whether you would call it a treaty, but whatever it would be, that would f ban this thing, um, do you, would you expect that all the countries that did not uh, like it would still go along with it? Um, would they? Would the U.S., for example, um, say, "Well, we wish you hadn't done this, but we will obey and not do it"? Uh, or how, how? What do you expect to see happen as a result of all these meetings? Um, we are wanting to build a strong norm which um, dissuades nations from using it. Now, the Ottawa Convention has done just that. It created an incredibly strong norm against the use of landmines. So even though there are a few states that are outside of it, US, Russia, and China, you don't see them really um, um, transgressing the norm that we have created, the norm that the vast majority of the world's governments have joined. Nobody really wants to be seen as a bad guy, right? Um, so norm creation is a big part of what we are doing here. The same is true of cluster munitions. That has created a norm against non-use. It hasn't quite stopped use yet. Um, but the inc incredible condemnation that Saudi Arabia has gotten, um, the incredible condemnation that Syria has gotten for the use of, of cluster munitions in those conflicts um, has, has helped limit their use as far as we can see from what we're tracking. Um, and so what we're wanting to do here is build a norm towards non-use. I was in a discussion with the Chinese delegate there, and we were discussing how to uh, define it uh, within the definitional section. And he said that it's really important that, he said, we can't stop any country from developing any of these weapons in secret, but we can stop them by creating the norm towards non-use as we have in the Chemical Weapons Convention. Um, where the definition is very simple. 
you can't use chemicals as a weapon. It doesn't stop the chemical industry from producing chlorine for uh, water purification purposes and all the medical applications that it has. But once you put a fuse on it and drop it out of a helicopter, you're going to pay for it. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Well, good luck. Absolutely good luck. I, I don't know how many people in the world are aware of this as a potential threat. It sounds to me as if it's such a sick idea, such a, a goofy, crazy science fiction nightmare that uh, nobody would do it. I mean, it, and, well, and before we go there, I'd, I'd like to ask Erin if she wants to add anything to my, my answer on that, because I just touched on norm building. Mm. Um, no, actually, you covered what I was going to say quite nicely. Um, one thing we, we know that um, in, in this particular case, because there is such strong industry support for a ban, mm -hmm. that it's actually going to be helping um, countries recruit the best and brightest um, when it comes to artificial intelligence um, and mechanical engineering and robotics and stuff. If you have a country that says, we will not do this. Um, there's a Canadian company um, based out of Waterloo called Clearpath Robotics. That was the first robotics company to say, we won't build these. We won't build autonomous weapons. We have contracts with militaries, but we won't build autonomous weapons. And apparently um, they have found that that is actually a recruiting tool. It makes people want to work for them. Mm -hmm. there, some of the reasons that, one of the reasons a very high um, high ranking sort of expert in artificial intelligence works in Canada and not the United States is he did not want his work weaponized. Um, so he moved mm -hmm. here and is now based in Canada. So this joining this treaty will actually should strengthen domestic artificial intelligence expertise because people want to save the world. They don't want to kill people. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and uh, that's actually one of the things I, I was I was going to ask you if, if uh, has there ever been a poll on this, what the public opinion uh, says about things like killer robots, what percentage of the people in the world say no, I would think 99.9. .9, but yeah, yeah, I, I can't remember the exact percentages. Um, but it's usually very strong in support of a ban. Mm -hmm. uh, a poll just, I think, came out in Germany recently that was also pretty strongly in support of a ban. And there was one study done by um, Charlie Carpenter a few years ago, and she found um, one of her findings was very interesting, I thought, is that higher levels of opposition to the use of autonomous weapons was found in um, among veterans, uh, military personnel, and their families mm -hmm. because... They don't want to face um, autonomous weapons. They don't want to face killer robots. That's not um, what they signed up for. They signed up to <laughs> like do other things. Actually, come to think of it, there is in the, in the military, there is some sort of old fashioned glorified ethic of warrior integrity and glory. And, you know, and if you're out there, <laughs> fighting a machine uh there you can't uh, you can't feel like uh, ulysses versus hector or somebody <laughs> well it dehumanizes everyone on the battlefield whether they're military whether they're civilian um taking out that human element of armed conflict is okay so how is it going to turn out i mean what are the next steps how do you actually turn this thing if if there is enormous public support for ban. How do you get there in, in organizational terms? Are there going to be additional meetings or what? Yeah, uh, there will be uh, additional meetings. So this meeting decided that they would recommend um, to the group in November. So essentially they meet in October in August and they've written a recommendation to themselves in November to continue this conversation next year. Um, what we need to see is that new man that mandate over the next year change to something along the lines of uh, negotiating rather than exploring. Um, but domestically here in Canada, 
Canada needs a policy. Canada does not have a national policy on this. Um, we need you to talk people to people right now could be developing these suckers. Yes. There are companies that can be building these things. Uh, yes. You think they are? Um, I don't know whether we're at, there is definitely some interest towards that, but I don't know whether it's a large scale um, project. There's what we call precursor technology. So things that are sort of on the way there, um, but we don't call them autonomous weapons mm. yet. Um, but what we I've need- seen pictures of something called Big Dog. <laughs> That's, uh, I, I guess, a, a, a smaller scale version of the the horror t tales that, that Yeshua envisioned. Uh, it's a very interesting looking critter. It looks sort of like a dog. It walks on legs and things. Hmm. Is that covered by this, uh, uh, this uh, conference? Uh, that is not weaponized. That's literally just uh, currently designed to carry heavy loads. Oh. Yeah. Oh, okay. Huh. All right. Uh, they'd be, it, it looks as if it could be quite useful. <laughs> If you're going on a camping trip or something in the mountains and need a little help. Yeah. Okay, good. Well, look, uh, let's all pray that we get this thing uh, through. Uh, I, I really thank you for showing up in Geneva and sticking it out, even if you had to go home before the, <laughs> you fell asleep. Uh, so, uh, uh, but you were there for another convention as well, uh, or conference, and uh, let's turn to that. Um, Tell me about that a little bit, uh, Aaron, and then, um, yeah, please. What what else did you do on your summer vacation? <laughs> if this was our summer vacation, I think both Yeshua and I need another vacation. <laughs> <laughs> um, so the second week we were there was the um, meeting of states parties to the Convention on Cluster Munitions. So this is uh, a treaty like the one Yeshua was talking about um, the Ottawa Convention on Landmines. So sort of built on that, um, this is another treaty that prohibits um, the production, use, stockpiling, um, and trade of cluster munitions. Now, to, if, in case you don't know, cluster munitions are essentially a large um, munition that has smaller, um, I usually explain it as a big bomb with little bombs inside that can be fired from artillery or dropped from a plane. And then the little bombs, it opens up and the little bombs can go anywhere over a large area because there's no control over them. I don't know how Yeshua usually describes it, but is that close to your normal definition? Uh, mother bomb and child bombs. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. <laughs> That's good, Aaron. I heard another word for it. I think that um there was a show that anthony bourdain did uh you know the chef who mm -hmm. committed suicide I, I sorry to say uh, about um was it cambodia where the they they had the most uh cluster bombs am i mistaken uh that was laos laos Lao pdr yeah and oh yeah beg your pardon yes and he he interviewed people and they showed their bellies you know where the scars and things were and talked about how horrible it was. I think they call them bombies or bomb bombies, I believe, something like that, uh, that uh, people can pick up or kids can pick up uh, on the, on the, when they go out in the, the woods or to someplace to play, they're all over the place. Is that right? I was in Laos and it is bombies is what they call them in Lao PDR. Uh, I was there doing research for the cluster munition monitor, which I will go into detail on in a moment. And um, I went to a hospital there and I saw a teenage girl. She must have been around 15. Um, and she had been working in a field with her father. They were doing hillside cultivation and she was swinging a hoe and it hit one of these unexploded submunitions, which then went off due to the impact of the hoe. And um, the result was she lost one of her legs from the 
blast fragments. Blast fragments went all over her body, scarred her face, uh, maimed her hands. And I was thinking, my God, these were used almost a decade and a half before she was ever born. So these, like landmines, these weapons carry the war into peacetime. So the war has been over for 30 years, but the war victims are not over. No. The war victims still are coming. We will still have more war victims from the Indochina War mm. for the next decade, for the next two decades. Yeah. This yeah. is not acceptable. And this is the reason why the cluster munitions are an internationally banned weapon by the Convention on Cluster Munitions, why we have been able to, to, to gather enough momentum on that convention. Now, how did that come about? You, got, you had the Landmines uh, Treaty to begin with, and you, was this sort of like expanding it? Uh, did you start a completely new um, negotiation process, or what happened? How did you get uh, real international law created? Um, Aaron, can uh, I take that one? Of course you can. You were there. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, going back to 1992, when the international campaign to ban landmines was formed, it's hard really to cast our mind back and recognize what the situation was like back then. But basically, it was not okay for civil society to involve itself with the security decisions and military decisions of countries. I mean, there always was a peace movement, and it was outside the door, slipping pieces of paper underneath the door, making noise with a megaphone, but it wasn't inside the door. And the group that started the international campaign to ban landmines was an unlikely coalition. It was war veterans. It was medical assistance groups that were putting artificial limbs on people. And it was human rights organizations. This is what started the international campaign to ban landmines. And when that started, everyone predicted you will never, ever get anywhere with this campaign. You will fail because so many states, it was common for them to own this weapon, to use this weapon, and almost every military force had standard operating procedures of using it. So they just said, you know, there's no way you're going to get anywhere with this campaign. And in 1995, I remember being in Cambodia and talking to a representative of the government of Thailand about it, and he said, there's one thing I will assure you, we will never, ever join this treaty. Um, the campaign tried getting a ban through the Convention on Conventional Weapons. That didn't work. Uh, together with uh, the visionary Canadian Foreign Minister Lloyd Axworthy, uh, the Canadian government and its resources, and a few other states, uh, we managed a process which called the Ottawa process, which took the negotiation outside of the UN system. And we negotiated on humanitarian grounds, which was, this is not acceptable from a humanitarian frame of reference. It's causing unnecessary suffering in human societies over and above the military utility of the weapon. And this cannot be. So it was not arguing from the standpoint of states and state security. It was coming from what is this doing to human beings? It's unacceptable. And this really formed the basis of what we call humanitarian disarmament today. And it not only opened the door for civil society organizations to involve themselves into discussions of how the military works in the world today, it ripped the, the door off the hinges and it pulled the jam out of the wall. And that's an opening that will never, ever be closed again. Mm -hmm. And I think it is one of the great successes of this campaign that tends to be overlooked because it's almost invisible now. We've had so many other campaigns that have come along and gone through that opening since then. The campaign to stop child soldiers, the movement on small arms, uh, the new movement on explosive weapons in populated areas, the stop killer robots campaign. They're all going through that opening that was created by 
the international campaign to ban landmines, the Canadian government and the Ottawa process. Um, so that was a huge, um, great movement forward by human society, really, in halting the horrible violence that was done by weapons mm -hmm. on the planet. Um, now, where was I going with all of this? I was responding. I don't know, but I want to say cluster munitions. Sorry. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Cluster munitions. Thank you, Aaron. <laughs> and so uh, cluster munitions essentially are almost de facto landmines. I mean, the harm they cause is very, very similar. You've basically scattered random death traps out in war-torn societies that carry on the killing after the peace treaties have been signed. And so it was the momentum coming off of the mine ban campaign that, that helped us get the Convention on Cluster Munitions. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, uh, good. And, and now it, it did, tell me when it actually was completed, the actual um, development of a treaty regarding cluster munitions. So, uh, go ahead, Erin. Oh, I was going to say the treaty actually turns 10 this year. Um, it was negotiated in 2008 and signed in 2008. Um, so it was a separate negotiating process from anything in the UN or anything under the Ottawa Treaty. Um, so it's 10 years old. It uh, got an extra state party uh, last week and we're hoping to hear from the... Pardon? What country was that? Next... Namibia. Namibia? All right. Yeah. Yeah. I, I was curious uh, when you said that I think Thailand said we will never, 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 never sign this thing. What was uh, in their minds? Why would they have? Why would anybody have been so clear that they wanted to keep on using uh, a weapon of that kind? Um, <laughs> yeah. What, what uh, well, was I would like to say add that they were one of the first countries in Southeast Asia that joined in 1997, too. So <laughs> their never, never didn't go on very long. Um, the, uh, there was a couple of things that added to the momentum for them. Um, uh, one of them was that the international campaign to ban landmines, after the Ottawa process had adopted the text, but before the opening of signature in Ottawa, in December of 1997, uh, the awarding of the Nobel Peace Prize to the International Campaign to Ban Landmines occurred. And a whole bunch of states came out of the woodwork at that point in time, basically saying, I think we want to be involved with this. <laughs> uh, that, uh, with the la landmines and, and cluster treaties too? Or just- uh, That was the, just the uh, landmine treaty. Uh-huh, okay. So the, the success of ICANN helped you guys with getting more signatories to the landmines treaty? Uh, the success of the ICBL, the International Campaign to Ban Landmines. That what, they won the Nobel Peace Prize in 1997, or I, I guess see, we I'm won. Sorry. Yeah, so I can won. Yeah, okay. I made, a, I, I, I made a mistake, but, I, but clearly I can was trading on the logic that you put into motion by this humanitarian argument that yes. instead of talking about the military advantages of how many people you could kill with whatever kind of weapon and and that logic of how to how to be most efficient in destroying your enemy uh just saying that is not acceptable no matter what? Never, never under any conditions would that be morally acceptable. Mm -hmm. That kind of stops people in their tracks because they're not used to dealing with moral questions when, when talking about a strategic uh, planning, right? Mm -hmm. I think that is, is absolutely wonderful. And, uh, it, it, and, and I would take heart from what uh, Yesha was saying about You've ripped the argument off the, the hinges off the door, you know, and uh, and so th there seems you're saying that there's more room now for civil society activists such as yourselves to uh, enter into discussions uh, with states in places like Geneva and and introduce moral is um, dimensions to the discussion. Is that the trend? Yeah. Well, we hope that is the trend and that's certainly our experience. Go mm -hmm. ahead, Erin. Yeah. 
that's a, a very optimistic way of putting it. We hope to, it's been the trend thus far and we hope to see it continue. Mm -hmm. All right, well, I would hope so too. Uh, although, you know, I talk to people who go to places like NATO. I think Eric, Erica uh, Simpson is uh, very shortly going to one of her usual expeditions to into the lion's den and talking to the uh, people in, um, in NATO headquarters and places like that about their plans. And they simply cannot imagine why anybody would want to do away with nuclear weapons because they're so good at keeping the peace. <laughs> so we have a way to go, I think. <laughs> I think we have a way to go. Um, tell, tell me a little bit more just before we wind up here about your organization. Both of you work for uh, Minds Action Canada, which is part of some other larger coalition of, um, of uh, groups. Uh, tell me about it as an organization. Erin? I guess I'll go. Um, yes, yeah, so Minds Action Canada is um, a humanitarian disarmament organization. Uh, that's what we do. Um, we work on, <laughs> uh, so that means we look at uh, mostly indiscriminate weapons and uh, approach our research policy and advocacy work um, focusing on what weapons do to people. Um, we are a member of the International Campaign to Ban Landmines. We're a co-founder of the Cluster Munition Coalition, as well as the Campaign to Stop Killer Robots. And then we also occasionally share our expertise gained from working on these um, those weapon systems with uh, the campaigns that are working on uh, the use of explosive weapons in populated areas, which is the International Network on Explosive Weapons and um, the International Campaign to Abolish Nuclear Weapons, or ICANN. Mm -hmm. um, and then I think we do a, a lot of research um, and uh, documentation of landmines and cluster munitions, which I'll let Yeshua explain because that's his, his area of expertise. Yeah. Well, one of the things that we, uh, I'll reach behind me here and actually pull a copy out. Uh, one of the things that we released, civil society released while we were in Geneva during the convention on cluster munitions meeting was this report, which is called the cluster munition monitor. And this is uh, a monitoring the, of the convention that is done by civil society, not by governments. Uh, it's, um, is the sister report to the landmine monitor, which looks at the uh, implementation of the uh, landmine convention, uh, the Ottawa convention. And uh, one of the things that we do here, which would be very different than state-based report is we use the convention, which we see as the solution, as a lens to look at the entire world. So we look at governments that have joined the convention and see that they are meeting their obligations. And those that have not yet joined the convention and see if they're doing anything that is in harmony with the goals of the convention or if they're doing something that may violate the obligations of the convention. And we catalog it every year within our report. And it is considered to be the monitoring body of those conventions. It's the de facto monitoring body of those conventions, which makes them very different than other international conventions, because in this case, civil society is actually doing the monitoring. The governments aren't watching themselves. We are doing the monitoring of it. Do you get any um, government funding for, to do to do this, or is this something you 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 dig around in the couch and find some pennies to cover? Uh, we actually do get uh, government funding on it um, for our last. Um, uh, issue, the one that I was just holding up to the camera here, the government of Australia, Austria, Belgium, France, Germany, Luxembourg, Norway, Sweden, Switzerland, and UNICEF uh, provided uh, grants that made this, this monitoring possible. There's one country, obviously, that was not present. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. That we may be living in right now. That's very sad. And what prospect do you have of changing that? Do you have any friends in Ottawa, 
in uh, in the government, or uh, are you some sort of uh, enemy? Uh, we're working on changing that. Um, the uh, the government is uh, rediscovering their love of the Ottawa Treaty, and so so we're hoping that in the next edition that will have changed. Mm hmm. Okay. Well, I mean, I would I would think everybody had celebrated so greatly and called it a great Liberal Party <laughs> success that the the gov government of the Liberal Party today would want to claim some credit for it and and build on it. But uh, who is to account for the thinking of politicians? Not I. No. Well, the thing to remember is that the, the Ottawa Treaty had all country support or all party support in Canada. Um, the treaty passed unanimously and um, no matter where you're a partisan, um, where you fall on the um, political spectrum, uh, everyone is proud of the Ottawa Treaty. Um, bring, the, bring your cat up forward. We want to, I want to say hello to your cat. Okay, he's a little cranky. Yeah, okay, I want to say hello to, it's a beautiful cat. Oh yes, I had a cat that was gray and white. Hello cat. Okay, look at me, little cat. Well, I guess it's not going to say hello. No, no. Okay, we've just about run out of time, and I know you have to leave. And uh, Yeshua, do you want to have the last word before I uh, say goodbye? Sure. Um, let me pull something off my desk, because not every day does uh, things go well for us. And mm -hmm. so when they don't, I pull off this little letter and I read it to myself. <laughs> this letter is from 1996, and uh, the campaign to ban landmines was still looking for people who would endorse our campaign, and we were going knocking on doors of uh, people, and uh, I was given the wonderful task of uh, going to the home of a person and asking for their endorsement of the campaign. And this is the message that I got. I support the international campaigns. The terrible total the landmines take clearly show the immense destruction and suffering these awful weapons are capable of causing. We therefore should consider banning landmines as a step towards ultimately achieving global demilitarization, for which I am determined to do whatever I can. I especially admire the noble work of the international campaign to ban landmines the ethical aspect of compassion is to refrain from harming others, not only fellow human beings, but all living beings. That is why it is important that we try to inculcate the value of compassion in our hearts while making efforts to ban destructive weapons such as landmines. March 26, 1996, Tenzin Gyatso, the 14th Dalai Lama. Oh, how wonderful. That is that gives me goose pimples. <laughs> that is a very nice, nice way to end this program. And I thank you both very much for this and wish you Godspeed <laughs> in getting rid of these, all of these terrible weapons and making sure that we don't have any, anything, anything like them coming up in the future. Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Thanks, Bye. Bye.